<laughs> right, welcome back to the Adventure Athletes podcast, guys. Um, we've got our first guest on, Craig Robinson. So, for <laughs> those that don't know Craig, he's a parkour coach. Yeah. He works at Fluidity Free Run Academy. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's one of the, are you one of the co-owners? Um, yeah, one of the uh, co-directors and co-directors. like, yeah, a coach. Yeah, I put yeah. myself more as a, as a coach than a director. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, from my experience with Fluidity, Craig is basically the head coach in my eyes. Um, he's got all of the coaching knowledge, most experienced coach in the building. Um, and then Fraser sort of runs the more business side yeah. and the admin. Yeah, yeah. Um, along with Otis. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So that seems yeah. about right to me. Yeah, um, kind of that's the structure, kind of. But we have some other like really good coaches as well, so yeah. Um, so how long have you been doing parkour for, Craig? Um, but like I, I started in about 2003, so I don't know how many years that is now, 20 years? 20 years. 20 years, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I started roughly in 2003, but like kind of knew about it in about two, like late 2002, um, and I was already kind of doing things which are similar to like what parkour is kind of, kind of developed through, and um, before kind of I knew about the name parkour, so yeah, that was roughly when I knew exactly what the name was and what I was doing, so yeah. Cool. Um, and give us like one thing I'm keen to ask guests is three defining moments in your life that pretty much brought you to be the person you are today. What would you say are the biggest three defining moments? Um, whew, that's a deep question. Um, probably one of them is like becoming a father, um, losing that like kind of selfishness. Yeah. Of like doing everything for yourself and having to do something for someone else. Um, going through some health problems, because then you get to the point where you realise what really matters. Um, a third one, I'm not sure. Just progression. Yeah. Just knowing that like just progressing is one of the best feelings ever, you know, stepping forward each day. So. That's pretty much three defining moments, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, I haven't actually asked Taylor that one yet, so we'll get to that on another <laughs> podcast. Yeah, we didn't even do it on your <laughs> one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so for those listening, they might not all be super familiar with parkour, free running, yeah. whatever name you decide to brand it. Um, could you give us a brief, brief overview on what parkour is and what your experience in parkour is? I think, like... Each person has a different kind of explanation of what parkour is. So, like, it's roughly the same for everyone, but there's kind of a different philosophy depending on when people got into it. So, like, I got back, I got into it in 2003 when it first kind of appeared. And the kind of, the way that it was kind of being portrayed was very, like, a martial art. Like, being, you know, strong to be useful, um overcoming challenges and fears and stuff and it wasn't too technical it was more like physical if that makes sense um so for me like parkour is just about like challenging yourself finding like where you're at and kind of comparing yourself to what you could do but now you can do and then it's like kind of like yeah like that kind of challenge ladder of like ticking off challenges and overcoming, you know, obstacles in a way of like, maybe some obstacles of fear or strength or this, that and the other. So for me, it was very like a martial art because I come from a martial art background. Um, But where it has gone today is very different and very split as it's kind of developed over the years. But for me, that kind of roots of it is kind of martial arts, challenging yourself, adapting, yeah. No. What martial art did you do? Um, I did a few. I did Shinokan Karate, Taekwondo, Wing Chun. Um, I did a little bit of boxing. My brother was a boxer. Yeah. Um, so I was always kind of moving and kind of imitating Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee films and stuff nice. like that. So yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, Bruce Lee's like one of the founding fathers of sports science, isn't he? Like yeah, that. pretty much. Yeah. He was ahead of his time, wasn't he? Way ahead of his yeah, time. Yeah. 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 Something I wanted to point out is your background to parkour is very different to my background in parkour 
Um, you did start way earlier than me, but I think I've got a more old school approach than you, like you were saying, coming yeah. from a strength and conditioning background. Yeah, yeah. My thing was to be strong, to be useful, and that's what I got out of parkour. Yeah, yeah. And looking at my style compared to your style, I'm very much like, I just want to do big jumps and push this. Yeah, like it's strong, like yeah, dynamic stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And then you're you're very flowy. Mm. That's something I wanted to talk about and how you got to develop that style, because um, yours is very Bruce Lee esque with your movement and the patterns you do, um, and I've always struggled getting that flow. Yeah. Okay. So I want to know like how you've developed that practice. Because when I look at you move, everything looks so natural. You could be doing a brand new move and it looks like you've been doing it for oh, years. Cheers, man. <laughs> because you've got such good <laughs> It's just the way you move just looks so natural to you. Yeah. But the way I move is very clunky because I'm just like, right, power, 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 power. power, yeah. power. And my movement, it's not bad, but it doesn't look as, as naturally good as yours. Mm. I think like everyone starts with that, that power journey, um, trying to do things big and like powerful and then i think when you get like a few knocks it humbles you and then it makes you realize technique's important and then if you practice technique re with repetitions that becomes smooth and flowing you know like when you you know slow makes smooth smooth make fast sort of thing it's like kind of going humbling yourself and going back to the basics and repeating them so much that it becomes second nature and then it kind of it's fluid when you move it's like it's natural, yeah. It's rather than so you say it becomes second form. nature. It's obviously yeah. you don't have to think so much what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So it's like embodied. It's it's there as a kind of reaction rather than like a forced. Yeah. So with well, I was saying his style is a bit more dynamic, and he's going for these like, you know more dynamic movements like big jumps. Yeah. Uh, and then with yours, you it's more for flow. So do you find within having that kind of flowy movement that mentally there's a sort of flow state going on as well? Yeah, so I kind of like parkour's weird because it's like it's part rehearsal and part adapting to whatever happens in that moment. So it's like kind of finding finding your flow is like practice through rehearsing, but then obviously mistakes just happen. So it's kind of like yeah, I, I'm not sure if I've gone off topic of that question there. But no, no, that's fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, remind me of where we were going with that again. Sorry. So do you find that having a flowy style of doing parkour for yourself versus Will's more dynamic style? Not versus, but kind of... Um, in that's contrast just, to your kind, Yeah, in contrast to. Do you find that for you gives you quite like a, a mental flow state when you're in it? When you're practicing those movements? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to answer that because like you've got like climbers that would be in a flow state for a very long period of time because they're climbing, they're under pressure and they've got to stay in that zone. With parkour, you've got like one gap, you might hype yourself up and then boom, it's done. It's like very short, but they're yeah. both flow states because they're both in a zone, but one's prolonged and one's quick, you know, so I'm not sure. <laughs> what does parkour look, look like for you then? Because Will's just told me dynamic states, now you're talking about doing like one big jump. So are you not sort of doing like a kind of piece together, longer movement pattern over multiple obstacles or is it more just kind of like one obstacle at a time or take, take me through your process because I'm coming into this with very little parkour experience. Like I did a little bit of my teen years, like dabbled in it yeah. and that was when it was actually like starting to trend online. They had this very stylized kind of imagery and it was starting to come yeah. into like James Bond movies and stuff. But this was, you were back in the early days when it was really young, you know, the name yet and it was like, it meant very different things in different ways to different people. So right, yeah, yeah. what does it mean to you and how do you actually practice it? I think, it, again, that's probably like the background of what I got into before parkour was like martial arts and everything to be done with like tech and touch and cleanliness and to the point where it's like less effort. Yeah. Like effortless effort. It's kind of one of the things like what Bruce Lee used to say sort of thing. But it's kind of, yeah, to the point where like you're focusing on all of your movement, just not to challenge it ahead, not just jumping that gap, but how you're running up to the gap, how you've done the gap, and then how you're exiting the gap. Like everything is kind of paced together in a nice flow rather than just kind of like reckless. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and something that I think is really interesting with your style of training is you take it back to nature a lot. 
which not a lot of athletes do really. Mm. I always see you like climbing trees, playing with your kids by the river, things yeah, like that. Yeah. And it's it's like an extension of your life. But then I feel like that might be something that's influenced your training. How do you think like, Massively, the, the environment yeah. like influences your movement? Yeah, big time. Like when I was younger, I always used to climb trees. And it, like, something about it, just the freedom of uh, just climbing up trees, jumping from them, swinging from them. Um, so I think like nature is really important for for all people, you know, and especially for like my kids, like just getting involved in like climbing, running, jumping in nature, being free and feeling that feeling. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, say that again, sorry. <laughs> so just like how do you feel the environment will affect how you train? Like how is the environment like affected? your training and your style of movement compared to how you see others do it yeah like i'm quite lucky with the environment i got as well like like locally like i can go out and i'm just like near woods and stuff like that so um it does have a massive kind of influence on how you move um just being in that environment but like obviously over the years like environments are changing aren't they they're becoming more urban less nature around um so it's nice to be able to do things in a park or like context of like in urban areas and in natural areas. I think that's what we've designed or we've evolved or however we've been created to move, um, to be able to adapt to all our environments, you know? So. Yeah, because me coming from London, I think this is a big thing that's determined how we've gone down those paths. So other than our backgrounds, I think that's a massive thing. Mm. But coming from London and just being like, is a big gap between two walls <laughs> everything's very square and yeah wicked. yeah symmetrical and then, like yeah and then yours is very like oh just go out play about in the trees yeah um i think that's had a big impact from how i look from your outside into your training yeah i think that helps you yeah it's like when you're in like kind of a natural setting everything's not all straight like you were saying so like the challenge is kind of pop out differently you got you have to start playing and then the chat then you start seeing the challenges rather than like parkour in like urban kind of areas everything's so straight you can ah oh, jump ah oh. you know like everything is kind of already there in your vision but with like when you're like moving in trees it's like you're just there looking at them for a bit it's like when you're climbing a wall you can't see the path until you start testing where you're going yeah. So, yeah. Do you feel like when you're actually performing parkour in a more urban environment versus an outdoor environment, there's a lot more rigidity and kind of it gets a bit more methodical when you're uh, indoors or more urban area. Yeah. Then when you take it outside, there is that unpredictability. There's a lot yeah. more play and yeah. you have to make more sort of not conscious decisions, I'm thinking about it, but there's more little micro adjustments going yeah. on every split second you're yeah. performing outdoors versus indoors. Yeah, it takes like a lot more. Um like awareness because everything is like changing everything's moving in nature like the branches move as you jump to them as you swing off them but like when you're in urban areas everything's static it's it stays still yeah so it's like i don't know that i don't know the science behind that but everything is moving and changing and you have to adapt to it like you know you have to be a lot more aware of what's going on so yeah, yeah. if someone's wanted to get into that more because if, if I look at getting into parkour for myself or someone who'd never done it before, the options yeah. I see when I first look are go to YouTube channel yeah. or go to somewhere like Fluidity. But what if someone wanted to take that path of actually going and learning how to do a more naturalistic outdoors style of parkour? Where would you tell them to start? It's, it's always good seeking out like a mentor, like a coach. Yeah. Um, a lot of parkour coaches are good and they, you know, a lot of people explore in a, like natural settings as well. Yeah. Um, but I guess, like, just even if you haven't got anyone to teach you, like, you're your own coach, just yeah. go and climb a tree, get that feeling, get that buzz, and then just see what you can do. See what you can create. Go back to your, like, child mindset when you don't have to be told what to do and you're just exploring what can be done. Like, you know. Do you think it's crazy that most adults want to climb a tree now and it's one of the yeah. most innately, like, human desires when you're yeah, kids yeah. to do? Climb yeah, it's weird, isn't it? No one does anymore. No one does it. No. It's weird. Fat kids get told off. It's actually weird. These days, yeah. <laughs> it's mad. Yeah. Do you think too much of that has not influenced just um, parkour training, but training as a whole, the industry in fitness, sports, strength conditioning, yeah. it's become very rigid and very sort of evidence by the numbers now. Yeah. Like, you know, we're all being put into gyms 
and told to lift and move and exercise in a certain way um it's becoming like unnatural if you like yeah um when yeah you you know we've been told to like get off that wall you know get down from that tree like don't do that and it's like kind of like you don't do that but you can do this <laughs> yeah you know um and i think yeah you've got to just go with your nature a little bit yeah yeah do you, do you find that like parkour is more than just uh like sports and fitness do you find some like a creative practice as well for yourself yeah 100 percent. it's like you've got this tool haven't you this human body tool like that you've been blessed with it's like how can you use it like what's the challenges like where can you take it you know yeah so so when you think about it innately before you even get to speech one of the most natural forms of expression is movement yeah i think it was actually we had movement before we could even um express any sort of like vocal yeah, communication yeah. It's so it's, it's built into the kind of like our biology or development yeah and it, you, you think about even when you're not speaking mm. the amount of communication you do non-verbally and how that's yeah. you know you, you say a lot more of your body than you do with mm. your mouth with your words <laughs> yeah <laughs> crazy and you say a lot with yeah. parkour yeah <laughs> that's true yeah that's mad to think that I think there was a, a study here about before. Well, not study. It was just a. Um, it was like an overview of species, and uh, I think it was actually talked between. Uh, you know, Ida Portal. Yeah. Yeah. It was Ida Portal. I think it was Andrew Hubman, and they were talking about before that there's no. Uh, I think it's, there's no species on the planet that can sing that also cannot dance before before we could sing. So they go hand in hand. Wow. Expression of kind of like joy and excitement through movement was like you cannot do that. Um, vocally without first being able to design the body that's crazy and it's like similar to what alan watts says it's like there's no body without the environment there's no environment without a body yeah it's like <laughs> it all goes together doesn't it like oh what's that what's that guy i can't remember his name now it's a guru is it somewhere there? it's not Bruce Lee, is it? <laughs> no you know that ah oh, that guru guy that sad, sad guru or something like that? i know the one you're saying like when you breathe in like you're breathing in the air that the trees have you know, yeah. moved out. So half your lungs are on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. <laughs> so we breathe out carbon dioxide. Yeah. Trees need carbon dioxide. And then yeah, trees yeah. produce oxygen. We need the oxygen to get the carbon dioxide yeah. back out. So it's a bit of a reciprocal kind of like... Everything goes together. You know, link. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy so, stuff. Sort of going with that, the thing you said about the half your lungs are outside your body. Um, and that aspect. It's not my so voice. <laughs> your life with like nature is like very different yeah um how do you go about reconnecting with nature because that's something i see you really pushing on your instagram and stuff so what's your approach how could people that are sort of stuck in this this urban environment go about reconnecting with it nature and what are the benefits that you found from your experience um some of the benefits i found is that just much more relaxed like much more of a joyful feeling like when I used to train like more in urban like areas, walls to walls, I don't know if it's the same for you, but I had to get like find this like aggression, this like this like kind of pumped up feeling that like, all right, I'm going to do this job. Like, like it's like a different emotion. I was trying to rise up to try and get this challenge done. But with trees, it's way more like playful. Like it's not much thought at all. It's just kind of, yeah, it's just weird. It's like a way more mellow feeling. Um, but yeah, there's a huge benefit. Like I feel you hear the studies of people like, you know, 20 minutes walking in nature will like give you like crazy, like kind of creative thoughts and stuff like that. So I don't so know, it would be, be really cool to find nature. out like people like actually doing studies on that. Cause you know, I don't, I'm not like a science head or anything, but like intuitively you can feel the difference of training in a natural environment and training in an urban environment with cars, beeping horns, dirty walls. You know, you got the smell of like the leaves, the trees, like nature just moving around. Like it's a different feeling. Like you know, it's almost like when you go into a gym, you're only experiencing what you're doing visually and yeah. tangibly. But when you've got doors, you're connecting to every one of your senses. Yeah, you're, you're literally connecting. Like everything's like coming alive. And like um, I know like a lot of um, have you heard of like movement natural? Yeah, more than that. So yeah, like um, and all that stuff, like. Back, back when they were like first developing their kind of movement programs, they used to train like topless because like the kind of, kind of the wind, the air, and like, the kind of environment on this skin was the kind of like 
stimulate their nervous system more and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, you have so, to sort of move about that. I'm the sort of person that I like to go train alone, exclusively like in the woods. So yeah, like, yeah. Where I work in the gym alone, just so I can train with a minimum amount of clothes on. Like, yeah, I, I yeah. do not like having clothes on that much when I train. Yeah, it must be something that signals us. <laughs> I, I, it just feels more comfortable to me now. Yeah. Like just. If I'm, I find if I'm training topless, I just generally perform better because I just feel more at ease. Yeah. Even when it's quite cold in the winter, and in the winter is a bit different, but definitely in summer as well. I don't find I'm too good with the heat anymore either. So that I find is another factor, and I'm quite about trying to get back in the back in the touch with nature, not just with my training protocols, but with my lifestyle as well. Yeah. So it's like I don't want to be constantly clothed in so much camphor all the time. I don't want to be eating foods that don't feel natural. I don't want to be staring at the screen all day. I want to really reconnect with nature and yeah. see how that marries yeah, into my training one, isn't it? as well. That's a big one. Like being all this comforts that we have, isn't it? It's crazy. Like yeah. it takes away the need to move because you've got everything given to you on a plate. But then there's more reason to move then because you get so comfortable that it gets hard. You may as well make it a little bit hard first, then kind of the comforts are a lot way more like enjoyable yeah you know you've gone for a hard run now you can enjoy like your hot tub <laughs> always i always find that like if i go out in summer and i spend like a couple of hours out in the sea surfing and getting like baked in the sun yeah everything just tastes better after you've been yeah, out the ocean. yeah you appreciate it more you do yeah, yeah. you really do yeah crazy so do you have any other <clears throat> practices other than just obviously going out moving in nature do you have any other practices um i know you're kind of into your breath work do you have anything else along those lines that you build in that really benefit your training and benefit your like mentality and things like that yeah it's like i do a little bit of like tai chi every now and again like well i try and do it a couple of times a week and that's kind of like movement with breath and i guess that's kind of like a mind body practice that kind of um taps you into your body a little bit more you know gets you out of your head and out of your like you know your muggy thoughts and a bit more like paying attention to, to your body and then paying attention to your environment so I, I think there's something in like that breath work with that with the hand movements um the like a lot of the Shaolin kind of you know methods have been doing for thousands of years and it's only coming back up now is like modern science but like these ancient traditions used to have it like they discovered that years ago. Do you know what I mean? We're just only discovering now through science. Yeah, yeah like sort of really, it's a little bit slow. Like <laughs> rediscovering and then validating. And yeah, crazy yeah, well. yeah. These have all come mainly from the east. Yeah. And what was you know pushed by the west is now something. Yeah. Oh, we're going to need to consider all this. Yeah, and yeah. Give it legit but to yeah, the it's research. like taking both and then. So, what together. breathwork practice do you have? Because some people might be familiar with the Wim Hof method. They might hear things like box breathing, the sleep protocols. There's there's quite a few more popularized. Um, they're not new the ancient forms of breathing that have become popular now yeah. in culture so could you walk us a little bit more for your breathwork practice yeah I, I honestly i actually don't have a breathwork practice but i know and i've read a lot about, about it apart yeah. from like moving with breath i think is like something that needs to be looked into a little bit more like since i've been doing tai chi like and you're focusing on the slow movements with your breath like breathing in breathing out way more fluid in movement you know, you're picking up a cup and it's just like smooth. <laughs> yeah. But um. Be like. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't have a breathwork practice, but yeah. I realise there's a huge benefit in it, and even when then it becomes like, you know, not just slow movements but powerful movements. Like look at boxers, they breathe out on like the punch, like they exhale quite sharp. Same weightlifting. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, weightlifting. Way I describe it with my clients quite. It's like a full body punch. Yeah, yeah. I so think like that. I'm not like looking at breathwork as like kind of getting any kind of spiritual craziness going on yeah it's more like how can it develop my movement you know yeah how can it tap me Do into you find my body it, gives, it gives the ability to both amp up and also to slow down when you need to yeah is that well calmness isn't it like when you're like you know especially if you're climbing up a high wall or if you're up high and it, you know you can feel your heart racing just like box breathing like four in holding for four Exhale for four, hold for four, just kind of calms you down, so gets you back. You say you're not really much of a sciencey guy. No. I'm a nerd for sports science. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm, I love all, all the breathwork practices. Yeah. I'm in Tai Chi as well. I do a bit of, yeah. uh, haven't done something in quite a while because my uh, um, routine, not routine, my uh, schedule these days is can't fit it anymore. But I used to do a lot of Chen Tai Chi uh, with a guy called Phil Hampton, amazing oh, coach. Yeah. And, uh, 
we did a lot of breath work with that and that kind of opened me up to how to use it more in sports. And when I've actually gone in and spent a little bit of time looking at it to sort of just talk about with using it to sort of calm down your clients like a ladder, mm. when you slow your ex, uh, exhalation down, so when you're actually breathing out, yeah. what happens is the diaphragm uh, lifts up as you breathe out and puts a little bit of pressure on the heart. And that little pressure on the heart tells the heart, like, take it easy, buddy. Like, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, give you a little lift and give you a little squeeze yeah, and yeah. feel that blood flow. And the heart goes, oh, thanks. And goes, I'm going <laughs> to slow down now. I'm going to chill out. Yeah. And the body goes, oh, rest state. Yeah, yeah rest yeah. and digest. So we go back into, we've got different nervous systems. With this two, we talk about a lot of sports science, which is the parasympathetic and yeah. sympathetic. So fight or flight, sympathetic, rest and digest. Uh, parasympathetic, that's the easiest way to kind of bundle them together in two neat boxes. There's more complicated pitch than that. So when we breathe out and that diaphragm lifts up and puts that little squeeze in our, it kind of puts us in a slightly more parasympathetic state. Whereas when we breathe in and the diaphragm drops down or rather retracts down, uh, it takes that pressure away from the heart and the heart has to work a little bit harder to actually pump blood so it speeds up a bit and gets in a more sympathetic state. And you think about it when you're in a panic, it's yeah. <laughs> lots of short so natural inhales yeah. and the exhale is really short. Yeah. Was, and we always say to people when they want to calm down, they take a deep breath in. Uh, one about the, oh, I'm not going to like the inhalation, yeah. whereas the exhalation, that slower portion, when you slow that down, that's where that pressure comes and we get in a more restful state. Wow. So you notice that the, the box breathing is yeah. it forces us to slow down all that, and all like sleeping protocol ones, what is it, five, seven? Yeah. Where your exhalation is actually slower Longer than your inhalation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's bonkers, isn't it? Like, really, when you think about it, like, you have the power to kind of regulate yourself if you were only to be able to, like, the first step is kind of just being self-aware, isn't it? It's, it's like catching yourself. Oh, right. It's yeah, very meditative cool, in that sense because yeah. you have to be consciously focusing on what you're doing. If yeah. You can't focus on your breath and consciously choose to control it, manipulate it to influence your body state. Mm. If you can't get out of your thoughts, if you can't hone in on the breath to begin with. Yeah, you've got to bring your thoughts to your breath like as well. Yeah. yeah. Do you find yeah. that, that practice for you inside of uh, parkour and tai chi uh, as you said, around the cup of tea, not the cup of tea, we go for a glass of water and get some slow. Yeah, yeah. How do you find that influences you outside of your actual practices themselves? Just things are done with like less effort and more res more results, if you like. You know, um, when you're in a calmer state, like you're not as frantic, are you? Like you know, and you can see things a little bit clearer. That's what they say. Like calmness is a superpower, I guess. Um, I noticed the other day. I was like trying to go back into my house really quick, put the key in the door, and I'm like, and it's stuck. And I'm like, just chill. And it just, <laughs> it just opens, you know? Like, I think, like, there's something in that, like, calmness that sees through, like, all your, your franticness, you know? Yeah. It calms down that... Uh, yeah, and it's in the breath. That chapter. Yeah, it's in the breath. But I haven't I haven't delved down that, that, that deep yet. I've only, like, discovered it from what I've heard, listening to... So maybe it is something now you're saying that, that yeah, I'll be looking more into, yeah. Interesting. You got any questions as well? So just like coming on from that, um, another thing I've seen you pushing quite a lot on is like spirituality. That's something you've been through a lot since COVID, from yeah. what I've gathered from outside perspective. Yeah. Um, what sort of, like, do you have any sort of spirituality practices? What are your like beliefs around it? What's your approach to to it all? Um, You're a very laid back guy, so like most of the time, what you do is just natural to you. Yeah. So I know, like asking you about it's like quite a weird thing. It's, it's quite a weird thing. Yeah. You don't think you just do? Yeah, yeah. I don't think too much. I just like get on with it. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. Over the years, just getting older. Obviously, I think everyone goes through a natural kind of realization about themselves and where they are spiritually, mentally. Um, I don't again have that much practice, but what I'm interested, I'm really curious of how different cultures and different religions say things, and then I realise, oh, that's quite similar to that, and that's quite similar to that, and it's like, oh, maybe I should try and be a bit more like that, you know. I, I think that's as much as my practice goes, you know. I, I don't like religiously like get up and do certain things. I don't know if you know it might develop like that, but um, yeah, I was interested by it you know, spirituality, different religions, different cultures, tribes, and like realize, oh, they all kind of do similar things in similar ways. And 
yeah, maybe it might benefit myself to practice some of them. Do you think in that sense that we're more alike than we are dissimilar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a golden golden thread that links them all together. Ken Bacon and, roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know you're like, you're in like, st- like stoic beliefs and stuff like that, yeah. So and that's, some of them are really similar to like uh, Confucianism, Confucianism, uh, Buddhism. Um, yeah, they're all kind of, they all got a, like a similar wavelength, but like kind of culturally different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's quite interesting to see yeah. the different people from different ages and times and backgrounds yeah. of sort of through the similar kind of experience of hardship and yeah. kind of recognizing suffering and the kind of human condition have come to very similar yeah. kind of beliefs, yeah. just with different kind of uh, faces or fronts. Yeah, exactly. And like with sports people as well, like a lot of sports people like really believe in like a kind of a higher power or like kind of like God that, you know, their talents are from that. And I think like believing in something bigger than yourself gives you more power. I don't know, maybe yeah. psychologically or really. Because <laughs> the quite interesting one I find a lot uh, is when I talk to people who say they're atheists hmm. and I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean to you? And they're like, oh, well, I believe in science. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm like, no, you're taking data and it's becoming a religion. So science, science in itself is like a religion, yeah. it, but it's very different in regards that it's not a very static religion. It's um, kind of doctrines. It's, it's it's actual kind of basis is that it's ever evolving and changing. It's always it's changing. Yeah. It. yeah, it's always and changing. It, it doesn't say no. That's not right. Mm. If it's presented with something, it goes okay. We got yeah. it. What we said five years ago. That's wrong. You can yeah, eat yeah. this now. Yeah, that's good because it's open minded. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, don't be too stuck on what certain science says like science is finding exploring and finding more like it's like science is more of a mindset of discovering ah i wonder what's it? you know it's not like oh it is that way and that's the only way it is <laughs> yeah um i think that limits like people then um but yeah science is definitely like a measurement rather than kind of you know a full-on it is that way and that's it yeah, yeah. Do you think it's a good approach that you can actually take from some of science and apply it to yourself, not just for um, like self development, but also for things like your sport and development as well? Like, can you go, oh, I have this hypothesis, I'm going to test it and see what the outcome is. And then from that, I can make adjustments. Can I prove something to myself by myself or can I disprove something? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I think everyone does it naturally, don't they? Because, you know, for example, diets, um, lifestyle, like the way you eat, um, you know, I was eating a certain way when I was younger and then I went vegan and it's like, that is science, isn't it? I'm testing what it's like on myself. Um, you hear facts and figures about it, but you don't know until you've experienced it. Yeah. If it's true for you or not, you know? So, so it takes through your diet then, because well, we're everything, fitness, adventure, lifestyle, self-improvement. So let's, let's yeah. have any diet then. My diet's not great at the moment, to be fair. Oh, <laughs> so I should avoid that one. <laughs> um, we'll add it out to save it, now. I've been into knowing about like plant medicines and um like what things are good for what things benefit and stuff like that and um back in like 2012 i just i developed a blood clot in my left leg yeah and obviously back and forth to doctors on blood thinners and stuff and i just thought maybe there is a natural way of like doing the same sort of thing as these blood thinners so i started researching what's good for thinning the blood and circulation um this, that, and the other, and I found out loads about it, and then kind of jumped from being like just not really thinking about my diet to being vegan, and that helped clear up a lot of different issues that I was experiencing back then. Yeah. Um, and I know veganism has got a lot of stick, um, but I think in some ways can serve a purpose, and it helped kind of be like a detox to my body. Yeah. But I think if you detox for long enough, you get the opposite results than why you started. So then yeah. Maybe like eating meat is something that builds you back up. I don't know, but... Do you, what components about going vegan do you think might have helped you with that blood clot from what you were kind of researching, finding out with your own body as you went into it? I guess, like, my body was inflamed. It's like inflammation, so it's like kind of like building proteins, not having enough rest, and I think, like, maybe veganism was a bit more on the alkali side, a bit more, like, kind of detoxing... It's not building myself up. It's more like kind of allowing myself to rest and break down. Yeah. And maybe that's what I needed at that time, depending on 
what end of the scale you're at is where you need to kind of move towards to balance yourself out. That's quite interesting. Yeah. So do you, do you find for you it's quite a reductionist diet? When I look at a lot of people go, so I've been vegan in the past and I've been vegetarian. Yeah. I didn't manage to stick it for more than like a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got quite ill on it actually. Yeah. But um, it doesn't suit everyone, does it? Yeah. No, it, it yeah. definitely doesn't. But mm. what I see with a lot of like the more modern popular diets now, like the keto diets, the primal diets, vegan, carnivore, paleo, uh, pescatarian, vegetarian, they're quite reductionist. Mm. So it's a lot about taking out certain foods. And although the target becomes that I'm taking meat on my diet, I'm taking carbohydrates out, it's almost like the exclusion of other foods within the diet that are gone are actually taken away. Like it's almost like 80% of the things that are gone are going to 80% of the problems. And then it isn't yeah. necessarily the things that we always focus on. And what I'm getting to is it's probably like mainly like things like sugar. Yeah. 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 I know like, yeah, just taking one thing out can be like a massive change to your body, can't it? Yeah. And what you put into your body like you are what you eat it's yeah. weird isn't it like literally like your body is made up of all this stuff that is just from nature and like whatever you put in it is supporting its development or wilting it i guess and yeah i think whatever you know like you know if you're going through like health issues or whatever if you're at that end of the scale you know that oh maybe i should start eating like this a little bit to bring that down or you know, I'm down here now, I need to build back up, I need to eat like this a little bit. But maybe like diet should be kind of in flow with like kind of the seasons. Yeah. So, I mean, we, oh. we, you know, in our country, like living here, it's like, you know, we have four quite strong seasons. Yeah. And what would be locally kind of available would be very different in each season. You were eating um, like avocados all year round. Yeah. I mean, growing Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Some, thoughts there like you know even moving with the land and the kind of the seasons more is a better way to, to not just eat but also to kind of live and train maybe yeah i think so yeah i think like having fruit and vegetables like locally from your area like you're a product of your environment so the food you have is a pro like you know you become the product of that food and if it's in your environment then you know it's grown with the water that you drink and it's the sunlight that you get it's it's the same sort of environment but, you know, we're getting strawberries from Spain. You know, we're getting avocados from wherever. <laughs> Who knows where meat, these days? Meat from China. Like, it's just... Yeah. So really, do you, yeah. Do you think that being vegan kind of brought you back in touch with that kind of sense of eating more locally, eat more sustainably, not just for the planet? I think going vegan body? for that yeah, period of time was definitely like a kind of made me aware of what I was yeah. eating. Are you vegan anymore then? No. No. I'm, I'm like vegetarian, but yeah. I kind of like flux in between different things depending on how I'm feeling. I guess. So you might eat a bit of meat every now and then. Yeah, every now and again. Yeah. Like a, yeah. like, so it's more like intuitive eating stuff. Yeah, yeah. If I feel like oh, I feel a bit, and I try that and I go, oh, maybe I'm, feel all right. Um, I'm yeah. all for intuitive approaches. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a little bit like uh, finances sometimes, or training yeah. where we're obsessed with metrics and data, Yeah. Uh, especially with things like sports science, but it's, a, it's quite a young science. So mm. a lot of the things that influence, like, Sports science is influenced by things that are like centuries and like really, really, really old in terms of philosophically. But then when yeah. it actually comes to the actual scientific side, it's quite a young science with mm. what we actually know about the body. We, we know barely anything about the body on the surface. And it's so complicated. It's like yeah. the ocean or space trying yeah. to explore it. And then we're like, oh, it's as simple as these numbers. <laughs> Just follow this yeah. and this will happen. Like, and even within that that we've even got like the, the five basic laws of fitness the last one is law of individuality mm. and even though as we say we're more like than we are different on yeah. a biological effort level we are very very, very different, different and we act very differently yeah. and how that rigidity sometimes might actually be the wrong approach well i think that the intuitive approach not just to training but also yeah. to nutrition is a lot better model so maybe your, your your environment does have a massive impact yeah um, like because you know, we all got genetically different, we're from different kind of backgrounds, but, you know, where you're brought up, where you live in is kind of, you know, everyone in winter goes a little bit like, yeah. <laughs> and then like, you know, you start coming up back out at spring. It's kind of like natural, isn't it? To, Talking yeah. about the seasons. Um, you didn't mention winter in here. <laughs> winter in. No. I was hoping you were going to say winter in. No. Um, what I want to know with you with the seasons, we're talking about how that it should affect your diet and what you're eating, and that will affect how you feel. Do you feel like it should affect how you train? Like, how does your training change throughout the seasons? Like, 
there's something that I was reflecting on as you was talking about the seasons. Like, oh, I do feel different in yeah. the season. Yeah, yeah. And I know, without even planning it, my training changes throughout the season. Yeah. Do you find like a similar thing? Yeah, like thinking about it. Yeah, like in the winter, you don't feel as energetic, do you? Like, no. there's not as much sun. Um, you haven't got as much energy. Maybe you're meant to reserve some energy. Like, look at a tree. A tree loses all its leaves. It probably protects the roots. Stays quite like in itself and then spring comes and it comes back out the energy it's is like hibernation yeah yeah so maybe we have to go through a little bit of a kind of down period to allow us to be better than in the other seasons it's kind of similar to like how like sport they train sports people in it like yeah I, was I, that I was phase think, or? exactly what you were saying about yeah, that yeah. i was thinking about um actually in fact i was reading um some uh papers and books uh this past week actually on stuff to do with um, annual, so what we call sports science is periodization. Yeah. If you mix them with like sets, reps. But then we've got like macro cycle and meso cycles. So macro cycle tends to be like the whole year. Mm -hmm. And there is that sense of like building up, peaking, and then also down regulate, and then also into winter to have like a more calm period where there's like a prolonged level of recovery going on. Yeah. And focusing more on just kind of like maintaining, but also repairing a bit and focusing on like yeah. rehabilitation style. style. Yeah. Still training, yeah, yeah. Like rehab, prehab stuff. And then coming back in then a bit stronger than the yeah. year before, yeah. And just think yeah. the influence of the seasons, like as you're saying about sunlight, in summer I find I always want to go for really long distance runs. Mm. I want to be out for hours and I want to be in the sea. But then come winter I want to do more I just want to eat. Yeah. And I just yeah, want to recover. Yeah. I'm gonna do a couple of heavy lifts, but yeah. I don't feel as I don't feel like I recover as well in winter necessarily. Yeah. I feel the same. I literally feel, I'm so bad in the winter. I'm not sure if it's my genetics or something as well. But like, yeah, I just feel proper broken in the winter by the end of winter i'm like oh my gosh i'm glad it's spring <laughs> yeah to come back to what you said with because I was, I was thinking exactly about that as soon as you said about uh changing your diet where sometimes you need that state of kind of like a like sometimes my body needs this to recover i need to be more on that alkaline sort of state you said or and sometimes actually feel like i need a little bit of meat do you think that kind of factors into that approach as well i think so yeah like in the winter like what's more locally available is more like meat stuff isn't it yeah and that's when you're in the in that kind of feeling of like not strong resting hibernating maybe you need more energy and then you know to come back then in spring and then spring then you've got more like sunlight which is kind of giving you that extra bit of energy maybe yeah uh, you know you can kind of maybe do a bit more of like a vegetarian diet or something like that that's do you, not so uh, heavy fast at all? um i have done fasting um i haven't for a while but like i've done like intermittent fasting i've done a few like 24 hour water fast and few 48 hour water fast but nothing like crazy but um, 48 hours sounds crazy to most people to be yeah fair. yeah yeah but yeah there's some like crazy mental clarity you get from when you just like stop eating and just drink water but yeah. obviously yeah you need to check out with your doctor to <laughs> just yeah. don't take my advice <laughs> how do you think that do you think that factors in maybe it's that cycle of training as well training nutrition movement seasons you think there's a time to fast and there's a time not to yeah, I, I, it's mad. Like all animals, I like, just know instinctively what they should do. Yeah. Like a bear just hibernates and just doesn't eat for ages, comes back like you know. Even the dog does it. Yeah, yeah. Dog eat grass. Like we just don't know what we should do. <laughs> it is so confusing, isn't it? Like. What do you think's caused that? What's What's made humans different from how the animals are? Well, maybe like, we're just we're just too smart. Like, TikTok. We're just, we're just like <laughs> too intellectually smart, not enough like instinctively like feeling you know um, yeah, that's that western approach again to maybe, thinking yeah. that's the feeling so i was walking a dog the other day and like my dogs are sniffing plants it'll just not eat one plant but it'll sniff another plant and just eat it it's like how does it know that that plant is good for it but that plant's not you know kind of like those with no knowledge passed down to it those like ancient you know? kind of systems and like yeah. atrophy maybe yeah we've lost that kind of connection yeah possibly but like yeah we're just yeah we're just getting more intelligent i guess especially with our technology but we're we're losing our natural instincts maybe i don't know if do you yeah. think that technology is like sheltering us at all do you think that's stopping us feeling these external environments with like things like air conditioning mm. like these stable jobs like everyone's in a building Bubble. like most of the time yeah they don't they've got full control of how things are do you think yeah. that affects huge yeah i reckon if you know you're in a, in the house too long, you're starting to feel depressed, aren't you? Yeah. Like you need to get out. Um, 
yeah definitely like our modern day of living needs to have some approaches of how like maybe our ancestors lived a little bit more natural um not so much you know lights in the evenings or you know being around campfires and being around nature i yeah i think maybe that is something we need to like does that factor into your life in a way do you think that 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 reflects your own lifestyle yeah like when i kind of realized that myself is i i realized yeah like i just need to be outside more um that was just making me feel way better just being in one environment all the time especially just like dark and dingy it's like you know that's not nourishing you is it no you know you put your you put a plant into like a small pot it gets to a certain growth and it can't grow anymore because of its pot you know you need to like expand it into the ground or whatever to make it like come through a little bit stronger you, you know? need to put it back where it's an actual environment yeah yes yeah. same with us maybe we need to be a bit more like swimming in the ocean running on the beaches just to kind of like get that power from oh man you've got a come nature. to train session yeah like, i'm all about that like, <laughs> yeah, carrying yeah. rocks or yeah, yeah. carry park from yeah. <laughs> throwing boulders yeah yeah do, do you think with your from... like so you said you need to get outside more but is there actually anywhere else in your like your lifestyle do you have practices around like you mentioned like too much screen time do you to incorporate any sort of routines or sort of just like ah okay that's it for the day yeah i think yeah like natural lighting like your phone and stuff like i catch myself on my phone so much and it's annoying like so i started putting reminders like on my phone like do you know I mean like to like remind me Get like it's me. bedtime or it's like do you know I mean put your phone down like do this now like because i think it's gonna get worse yeah it's just gonna get worse. Like the next gen, I get scared by it because like my kids got like tablets and it's like straight away. Can I go on my tablet in the morning? It's like straight in the morning when your like mind is like in a kind of a dreamy state and then you're just on this screen instantly with this like blaring light. That's, that's scary, dude. Like I just go to work in the, the service industry a lot and I would see the amount of families that come in, sit the kid down and go plunk. There's a tablet. And I was like, Oh my god! After a while, I was like, "That's really bad." Like, so it's like a dummy, isn't it? Like a pacifier. I, I know my mum and dad are stressed, and like, they, they, yeah. it, it, you need a bit of chill. But it's yeah. like you're actually sat like, down in like a so, social environment around uh, like your family members as well, where you like those are quite memorable moments, especially when you're like a kid, where you like meet sometimes meeting family for the first time. It's like, bump, mm. there's a tablet yeah. in front of the kid. Yeah, and that becomes almost like and that, those early years is when you're the most sort of plastic as well. You're the most yeah. moldable. I think with this, like, listening to it, Craig's got a very sort of intuitive approach of he, like, knows the feeling and it feels bad and you're like, mm. oh, I feel bad because I'm looking at it so much. Yeah. Um, and then see... You know when you've had enough. Yeah. Don't you? Like, But you step, step, stay on it, don't you? Yeah, because it's, it. something it. is doing it to and you. And I think you know? Taylor's very, like, sports science and, like, oh, this is the science behind it. Um, yeah. And I think that they needs need to, to come be a together. Balance of yeah. the two. Yeah. Like both have got that understanding, but if you like understand the science of it, you're probably not gonna do it. But if you only yeah. know the feeling of it, then you feel it, and then you feel guilty because you're like, oh, I'm still looking at yeah. it too much. But yeah, you not... need to understand why you're like that, yeah. and what the benefits of not being like that are. But also have yeah. the feeling yeah. of that like guilt, like you've got like I'm looking at it too much. Mm. Oh, this is going to affect like my circadian rhythm. It's going to yeah, mess yeah. up my sleep. Yeah, if you if you knew the that. facts of the science, yeah, maybe you would act a bit differently. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. That, like, uh, yeah. I think a lot of people know what's bad for them, but they don't act on it because they don't feel it. Yeah. But I think part of being too ingrained in it. Yeah. It's a bit like, you know, the Matrix, you're just a bit too plugged in. Yeah. You yeah. can't see what's going on. We're like, yeah. right, well, you're on TikTok for eight hours a day yeah. and like, that'll fix it tomorrow. I think it's just like, it just puts you in a bubble, doesn't it? Because like the way your kind of technology works, it just feeds back what you're kind of looking at, back at you. So you're just stuck in this, like only seeing things that you like to see. And like, it just feeds it to you and you're feeding it. And it's just like... And you've got quite a warped perspective yeah. in the world there. Yeah. So this is quite this interesting thing I've seen talk about before where in sort of my mum and dad's generation, it's like, oh, well, everyone going to work and it was like, oh, well, how did you see the news this morning? Did you hear about the ball game? Did you hear about, oh, there's that crash on Main Street or where then? There was like, there was that localised kind of news we all talked about. And now it's like we open our phone in the morning, we absorb like an hour of social media and our feed is entirely curated to us, our interest and the algorithm, which is just his not evil the algorithm, it's just doing what the algorithm does. Mm. It's, it is just data. Yeah. And it's just feedback what it thinks we enjoy and yeah. what we're going to actually want to keep looking at. Yeah. And 
we go into work then and we've got a totally different perspective of the world and then we come into contact with someone else and it's not like a that um sort of like like you and i have got unique life experiences and we come together sort of thing it's more like i've been fed one perspective and then i come into the world and it's like almost like a versus and a yes, perspective that's, that's all you see it creates a sense of yeah. like them and the other but on like, yeah. the individual level not on kind of groups but like my even though me and will are interested in, the, in very similar things i can guarantee if i hand in my uh phone and he played my instagram account he'd probably find my feed is very different than if i were on his yeah, account yeah. even though we've got similar kind of interests and views and all topics and maybe it's quite helpful just to know that and then you realize that oh i'm kind of in a bubble yeah and like Maybe that's your way of stepping out of the bubble every now and again and seeing what else is out there, you know? Yeah. It's like, oh, what was that thing someone was saying? I can't remember who it was. But it was like, oh, just take a look around the room now and see everything which is like the color black. And then you like close your eyes and then you're like, right, tell me what was brown. And it's like, you only see what you're kind of programmed to see. Yeah. And until like you realize there's other things outside of that, then. Or isn't it like that? There was I can't a, remember what it was. But. There's a study where uh, they got course, someone to play, play, play football. Yeah. <laughs> Another study. They got someone to play, play football and that's, you had to watch a video or actually watch the match and you had to say how many times they scored yeah. and they were like, how many of you seen the panda? And they're like, what? And there was a guy in a panda suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah back, I see that. Yeah, in the background, just like... <laughs> yeah. Like, Hi! And then yeah. no one notices it because they're only really focused on what they've been told to yeah. focus on. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah, the mind's weird. But it's, yeah, got to just be aware that there's more than you can see. Yeah. And that goes back into spirituality, doesn't it? And like and a, a, a kind of technology version of, of, of that, like a, like a metaphor is that, you know, you can't see Bluetooth, but it's connecting things, isn't it? Yeah. You know I mean, like, we, we only, all the science that we've made is just a study from nature. Yeah. But done in a more, like, logical different way of thinking kind of yes. order from chaos yeah something that i actively try and do with my socials is engage with things i disagree with so then i still get all those opinions i think that's something that's yeah, massive that's that idea, most people yeah. don't do mm. is i will like see posts that i disagree with and i like it and i engage with it to keep my mind open to others opinions and yeah. so i'm constantly feeding the algorithm stuff that not only i agree with but i disagree with and sometimes people look at my feed and be like why do you like that that's yeah it could be like something they really disagree against yeah like there was a big thing about like andrew tate and they might be like oh why do you like that post about like misogyny and that um but then you're also liking like trans people's things mm. and i'm like i'm keeping the the conversation open yeah you know i want to know all the points so then i can make my own your educated own, yeah, decision yeah, yeah 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 but still engage with it and something that i do a lot and i do this a lot with my coaching is people will come to me especially with gymnastics and be like oh, why are you doing it that way that way is wrong i'm like i'm trying it out if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't and then people will be like oh have you thought about this and they show me a different way and I might try it and be like, oh, it doesn't work. Or I might try and be like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why have I not thought of that? But then I'll always try and bring it back to what's my belief on this? Does my belief yeah. need to change? Yeah. So it's like every every individual has like literally a different point of view. Like I'm seeing you from this side of the room that way. You're seeing me this way. But also as in opinions, like we all have a different point of view. So like keeping your mind open to like other people's way of life of thinking is then the ability to kind of be like bird's eye eagle view and be like ah that's what it's about rather than be like ah oh, no this is what it's about and i can't I change my is, mind like <laughs> i think this is something really important to do with coaching as well is like we've got a point as coaches looking down on our students being like this is where i'm picturing them going this is like the perfect mm. technical model of what we're doing that's what I'm looking at and I want them to match that but then it's also not just us trying to get them to do that but realize they've got all these other influences as well mm. and they've got their own dot mm -hmm. so our dots might be aligned but from our point of view it's different yeah, yeah. so then it's like how can we bring them to like 
to see say there's like a dot there and they've got to like at least cover our dot so then our needs are being met as the coach and we know yeah. what we're doing is effective yeah but it might not be in the same place it might be like above it blocking our view because they've yeah. got a different perspective it's yeah. just like how do we align that with with who we're coaching that's hard isn't it it's like you gotta like help them step outside of their own view to see it from your side as well and as a coach you've got to see it from their side to understand where their limitations are and what their beliefs are and stuff about themselves. Um, but I guess it's like you got well, you know, with, with any kind of relationship, you've got to build a rapport, haven't you? And when they when they feel like they kind of know you as more than just a coach, like you're someone that they can relate to, then they might be able to take your advice or like recommendations a bit more on board. And then, you know, they only have to see a little bit of evidence of what you're trying to prove. And they're like, ah, I understand that now, you know? And then they open up to your way of looking at things, um, which might benefit them, you know? Yeah. So. With, like, everything we've spoke about then, so we've got, like, the connecting with nature, how different people's environments will influence their movement and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think being a parkour coach is probably the best person to ask about this thing because, you, like we've said, I've got a strength and conditioning background, yours is martial arts, our approaches are very different. Mm. I've got um, a more dynamic and um, like powerful sort of movement from being in an urban environment. Yeah. You've got more of a background from nature. And we've said how all these different things shape our movement and how we connect with nature and everything. And then as a parkour coach, your job is to coach someone how to move. Mm in like a very broad sense yeah. like how do you use everything we've spoke about today to like influence your your students as their coach like how does it influence your practice as a coach yeah it has influenced my practice as a coach like doing more like natural stuff i realized that first to become like a better mover that we should do things which are in our nature like you look at tribes that can jump really high because they just jump all the time or the tribes that can throw like spears stones you know we hunt we're crawling so maybe like covering those natural movements first is like a foundation or the roots that like allow you to develop into different branches of movement practices because then gymnastics is very like technical isn't it you know but then like might lack the ability to like kind of like stick a jump like smoothly without looking very like you know robotic you know um so yeah i i would say like my style of like teaching is the first remind people of their natural way of moving or a natural way of moving because we always have had an environment and then and then to put add-ons onto that as like kind of skills yeah how would you go about like do you have like a set model on how a movement should be performed when does like because for me i look at a jump and there's like a technical perfect model of right this is how we take off for a jump mm. for it to be safe and for it to be effective they're the two things i'm looking at really when i coach yeah, yeah, yeah it's for this movement i want it to be safe but i want it to be effective if we're yeah. doing a vault like a concrete I want them to be able to get the maximum distance out of like that concrete or like make sure they're clearing the wall so they don't hit their knees, things like that. Yeah. How do you go about giving them a perfect technical model while also not limiting them to this is how your movement should be? Mm. Yeah, because having that technical model, you know, we're not all models which are made the same. Do you know what I mean? We're different, like that model's different to that model. Like we're built differently, all of us. And it's like, I guess as a coach, you need to be able to see where someone's weakness is in their movement or strength is, or like where they're failing on something or where they may, you know, be able to be more successful if they were just to kind of tweak this little thing. Um, but I guess it's more on principles of like, kind of um, feeling like it's effortless for that person, feeling like it's light and it's still powerful. Um, but I guess, yeah, you've got the kind of model as principles but then you've got the movement model. It's like, it's going to be different because people are built different, you know? Yeah. But how do you go about coaching them without 
limiting them in a sense because this is something I always struggled with as a parkour coach mm. because I'm primarily a gymnastics coach so everything yeah, yeah. I coach I'm like from a very young age I'm like no this is how it's done you have to do it like this and then we hand pick the kids that can do what we've asked and we're like right you're going down this elite pathway and then when I was coaching parkour like I used to have that squad so yeah. I was very much like we're doing these moves because it progresses like this mm. and this is how it's going to be for competitions for performances this is what's going to look best that I'm looking at like getting that edge in performance whereas your coaching is very different because parkour is very different parkour so diverse isn't it yeah. like it's just so open for like different things to come in whereas like you know you pick like sprinting for example you know sprint coaches would teach people to run like a certain way because that model fits a successful outcome of speed say but then you get someone like you saying bolt and then they just completely like run different and they run the fastest yeah. you know what i mean so i think yeah you maybe you need both you need to have like a model like a basic model but then if it's not suiting that person because they're structurally different it's like how can you as a coach see like see that and be like, ah okay maybe they should try it like that because they like that you know but um that's a that's a hard question like it's only when you've been coaching a while that yeah how do you stop limiting people but because that's you know. that's what i've like always admired when i've watched you coach is you always find a way to coach people without limiting them to a certain thing or like a certain way of moving and how you're so open about it but i've always struggled reproducing that as a coach again our coaching backgrounds are very different yeah mind strength and conditioning and, and then gymnastics. gymnastics yeah so it's very much they have to, rigid yeah. this is what you do yeah, yeah, yeah. everything else is bad mm -hmm. and even though i've come from a parkour background i struggle coaching in that way of like yeah just move like this and not being so limited to how they move yeah so i'm just like really trying to like get out of you how how you do that like how do you help people progress without setting those those clear boundaries i think yeah i think it's ultimately just seeing the individual for who they are and what they're capable of what's their strengths what's their weaknesses um where they look strong where they're kind of you know you could see if someone's not as flexible as someone else or someone's more powerful or they're like you know they're great with jumping but like you know they can't hang or pull up their own body weight which i mean like so i start with that kind of the basics of like what a hu how a human can move and what it can do um in the natural sense without adding skills to it but then skills does have a model that you have to follow to be able to you know learn about physics and how the you know momentum works and stuff like that is there like um, a particular sort of learning model you like to come to when you're teaching people of you know there's different models how people learn or is it just sort of something you've developed for yourself through years of practice and reflection? yeah like i've never been academic and like with coaching i know there's coaching models and way of coaching and um i couldn't even list them but i know there's different ways of getting a better outcome from your student but i think once you build rapport and then you can catch them out on what what they're thinking do you know what i mean where they're going, where their limitations are, be it physically or they just think they're limited. Do you know what I mean? And then go from there. I'm yeah. really, I'm really just sussing the person out, and then going with what I feel do that, do they I, could benefit from. I think yeah. every young coach ever forgets everything they've learned about behavioural yeah. models and learning because there's so much. Yeah, there's there. so many. But when you were on about dealing with people and not putting too many um, constraints on them, it actually reminded me of the. Um, the actual model called constraints led learning where mm. where you you don't tell people exactly what to do but you kind of set the constraints on yeah the yeah yeah and not long but that set, doesn't limit then yeah the, how they move then it's not the even moves, yeah. they might not even know what the constraints are but yeah. you might just manipulate them and kind of stand back and let them figure it out for themselves which is yeah. more kind of like an intuitive yeah natural it's if, like, if i give you like a tennis racket and i throw yeah. a tennis ball and i was like i'll oh, just hit this back to me yeah. and i was throwing it head height you would do something different as i'm changing the height of it you're going to change 
what you're doing with your body to like send yeah. it back to me. But I'm not going to be like, right, I'm going to throw this at this point now. And I want you to lunge in like this yeah. <laughs> set way, like during this, like, I'm not saying how you should do that, but the challenge is making you change how you're doing that. Just that model sounds quite sort of similar to, yeah. Then it's not hundred percent what you do. Would you find that sort of it without you knowing that kind of sounds a bit like what you do? Yeah, that is that is probably more of what I do because I'm dealing with the environment. So it's like, oh, we got this height now, or we got this rail, or we got this wall, or we got this tree, and like that's the challenge and how you can how that body can adapt to that certain obstacle. Um, and yeah, there is like models of like moving, and we've named things of how to move, but everyone's gonna attack that obstacle in a slightly slightly different way. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go on. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that's probably the main difference between gymnastics and free running. Yeah. Like, there's always a big argument, and then with, like, Fig trying to buy out parkour and all of the politics behind that, um, I think that's the fundamental reason why it's never going to work. It's mm. like, gymnastics is very, this is a set environment. With and set then, apparatus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's very much like, what they're doing is they're maximising what they can achieve on that one thing. Yeah. So the technicality and everything of it is getting so, so extreme. Yeah. And like the actual performance is incredible. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, where the performance side of coaching and the yeah, love for performance yeah. coaching for me comes in. It's yeah. just like, how far can we push this? Yeah, yeah. And then with like parkour, it's very much like, you no, know, here's like the very basics of what you need. Um, let's see how many different places we can make it work and how you can adapt it. And that brings its own challenges, but makes it like, very valuable in a different way. Yeah. In a sense. Almost yeah, like a so. specialist versus generalist. It's like you've got the same obstacle and then like, I guess it gets more technical because you have to become more creative to find things that you haven't done before or things you've done before and what could be harder. So it's kind of that way is cool as well. Um, but then when you've got like ever changing obstacles, then it's down to more creativity still in, in part of it, but it's more adaptability to what you can already do, but done on something slightly different. It's just weird, isn't it? It's like- so We have quite different. an interest in, um, this has brought two points to mind to the mother. Yeah. One was me and Will had a conversation on one of the previous podcasts about a uh, sort of elite level of performance athletes where they can just handle doing the same level of training over and over and over. Yeah. And then on the contrast to that, you've got this more diverse level of um, training and movement because obviously there's, there's a bit of a differentiation between training per se versus like practice and having a practice. Yeah. But then also it reminds me of this um, paper, was it paper? No, it was, it was a book I read called... Um, range by david epstein and it was about generalists and how they mm. sort of perform in um peak level environments and mm. it was actually surprised that most peak level uh kind of performers were generalists a lot younger in life before mm. and they were late adopters to their specialization yeah. but one thing in particular and in mind when you said that there was more kind of figuring out for yourself and problem solving is when we talk about tech earlier in terms of ai is computers are very good, at, and this is why they've started beating humans at chess, at solving mm. predictable problems. Mm. When it comes to a problem, they've got to think for themselves, or it's a changing problem each time. They're not very good at unpredictable patterns. They yeah. can beat chess, like hands down. But if you give them, they call it like a kind learning environment where it's a repeatable pattern versus a cruel or wicked learning environment yeah. where it's you have to keep changing the solution and you have to keep changing the equation yeah. and the actual inputs entirely different as well. So yeah. They're not really good at that computers, but yeah. humans dominate that every single yeah. time. Yeah, and that's what I was saying about like AI is trying to catch up with what nature can already do, it seems like. Because you know, you've got that Boston Dynamics, I mean you like, you know, those robots are doing backflips yeah. now. But like how robotic it is it gonna look until the robots like literally flow in and can adapt to every system different changeable thing yeah how much programming that needs when a human's just got it like that like just by looking at it once it's like and you can just do it you know and so you see those little salt courses lay out yeah. them. it's like well what if you suddenly just adjust the height of everything yeah yeah everything's random hit the like, surface with the rocks how much, like, and make uh, it wet yeah yeah how much programming that would need yeah. 
for that robot to achieve that, like we've already got that. Like, like we are like the best machine, like ever, really, aren't we? Like, like a perfect I mean? expression. Yeah, yeah. Nature. And yeah, robots. After a while, it's going to gather rust. It can't rehabilitate themselves from rust and break. We can break, and then there's something about us that rebuilds. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we're not there with robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not there with robots, but just giving those tech companies some ideas, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> healing robots. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Cool. Well, I haven't got anything more to ask. Do you have anything more to ask? Uh, I did on the... Ah, yeah. So, come back to mine and Will's conversation, actually, about uh, peak-level um, athletes where they're doing just the sort of same learning and uh, not learning uh practice over and over and over and over and over again mm. how do you find that differentiation because you're talking about gymnastics in contrast to parkour where parkour seems to be more free and problem solving orientated and more uh i said a little more expressive and creative yeah versus um gymnastics is very rigid it's very uh you you train for this it's very a specific skill mm-hmm. would you make a lot um I think they're both they're both needed aren't they like you need to be able to have a rigid like kind of repetition on certain like basic fundamental things um so that it becomes like second nature and you and you get strong um you know like weight training you know you're programming your body to move strongly in a certain way of moving um which you're not going to get as fast if you were to do loads of different things i'm not sure actually maybe you will but um I don't know, the approach is very different, but they're both needed, I would say, in both parkour and gymnastics. Do you think one so, is yeah. harder than the other, or do you think they're equally hard in different ways? I think having one set way of doing things over and over is harder mentally. Yeah. It takes like a lot more um, discipline, I would say. Um, whereas like doing things which is like kind of a bit more intuitive and creative and playful comes from a a different place of maybe like love and joy yeah and it's not very much hard work but in life nothing comes easier unless it's hard work so it's like finding that joyful play and that kind of disciplined like push put them together you know which is that might be a good solution to this modern problem of too much rigidity and training and lifestyle and living with tech do you think that maybe because Discipline is finite. It, it's like yeah. a resource, and you know, people, easy not just easy, sorry, not easy, like, motivation is yeah. finite, and then discipline is that practice outside once motivation's gone. Yeah, some people yeah. struggle with discipline severely. Yeah. Do you think maybe that more um, intuitive? It, it was when you mentioned the word love in particular in there. Yeah, that yeah. do you think that might be a good kind of process for people to take who do struggle with that discipline side. Like you guys are very disciplined. I'm not sure the level you've got to made that realization, but like you're definitely on that like path of it, where I can see, which is wicked. But it's like, yeah, like it's so hard to be disciplined like over and over and over again. But then maybe some people that struggle with discipline and not quite got to that level that you've kind of discovered, it's like take a different approach of like playfulness. Yeah and play and just the love of like and the joy of just moving around and and not being so kind of hard on yourself um but they're both needed do you think it kind of comes and goes in waves that there's a level of discipline that you need to get to and once you get there you move more into that intuitive approach and then after a while maybe there's more discipline that's needed to get that next level because i've certainly found my own training there was the foundation it was a little bit of experimentation but a lot of discipline yeah and now as i get into um i'd say probably in strength condition coming up for nine years now mm-hmm. i find that it's a lot more play and exploration again versus yeah. being disciplined and for, for me if it's too disciplined then i lose a lot of interest in it yeah. but also i find that if i'm not problem solving then the difficulty becomes mundane and the mun the mundaneness of it is the ball is and the boredom is the difficulty instead of actually trying to challenge myself to grow um, yeah. Almost as a person, but it's just repeating the same thing. But you must have specific. come to a, you must have come to a realization that where you want to be takes discipline. Yeah. So that's why discipline. You realize the importance of it, and then you go in towards it. Um, but yeah, like with discipline, it doesn't come from love, love and joy, because that's feeling. I mean, discipline is a commitment. It has nothing to do with your feelings, really. 
because, do you know what I mean? You don't feel like being disciplined, but you know that it's good for you because it's taking you to the path of where you want to be, sort of thing. But you guys have got that vision of seeing where yourself, where you could get to, and you only you only get to there if you're going to be disciplined. That's why it's been like this in Western, in contrast to Eastern model. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. disciplined, very unloving, very cold kind yeah, of approach yeah. uh, with the West more. Yeah. It's it's kind of stoic, like, like hard rock. Yeah. Like, Do you think there's yeah. too much of that now? Or so maybe it's. I think it's necessary. Like, you know, we look at like David Goggins and stuff, like yeah. the ultimate extreme of it. Like, do you know what I mean? Look where he's got to, though. Like, like, do you know what I mean? And they need to carve him and Marvel. Yeah, but there's some people that only like only that type of person would spark something inside of a type of person with that approach. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then other people might be like, ah, you know, he'll never, he'll never spark them because they're not that type of person. But maybe like a different approach might. I mean, playfulness, adventureness, and then they might discover that discipline is the yeah. thing for them, you know? Do you think almost um, like that diverse, more um, adventurous, explorative kind of approach lets you find that area or thing for you that lets you hone in and get that sort of Goggins-esque mindset yeah. about it? Like for you, for over the years I've known you, you've gone from like a very playful parkour guy, you know, powering gaps and stuff like that, and then you've just then all of a sudden just become more and more disciplined every year that I've known you. Because you must be knowing where you want to try and get to. So, yeah, I think it definitely opens up after that kind of, you know, you do it for that joy, that cool look, that, you know, freedom, that's all feeling. And then you realise, ah, oh, I need to, if, if only I was disciplined, I'd be that much more better or whatever. But yeah, like, life is about taking that step, progression, growth, you know, everything kind of grows to a certain extent. Like, look at a tree, in it, Like, tree example again. I mean, it's just going towards the sun, isn't it? It's going somewhere. And if you almost look at the development of the tree as well, later in life, it's got that very one linear path going yeah, up yeah. first, like the more like yeah. disciplinary. Yeah. And then it's branching out into loads of yeah. sort of unpredicted, more. Yeah. Different you know, paths. Like, yeah. But it comes naturally. It's not forcing itself to do that. Like, it's not over ambitious. It's, it's heading that way because that is it's that nature. I mean, sometimes we become over ambitious and it becomes a weight on us then because we're not seeing results or whatever like that but it's like you've got to be bring it back down and be humble and patient with it and realize you're going somewhere of, like. um a term that plato had and i can't remember it now and it's like a grass knows how to grow you know like trees know how to grow the yeah. the waves know how to wave you know yeah, yeah, the yeah. birds know how to sing it comes yeah. naturally to them yeah from my experience like a lot of that freedom comes from the discipline yeah like you can't have that freedom without the discipline yeah um i've seen this a lot in my life and like you said since you've known me it started like off playful Mm -hmm. before i was that playful person i was very disciplined Mm. and rigid and then i became that playful person because i had that discipline and then i think i lost a lot of the discipline i went to the other end of the spectrum lost it all and i lost that that trunk that root that held it all together um went through like that bit of that dark period that i went through mm-hmm. um i know we spoke about it on the podcast i've spoken to you about it yeah like in person um in person as well and then what i'm doing now is i'm trying to build that discipline back up to open up that freedom because if you yeah. like i've experienced in my life i went through periods where i struggled having a routine i wouldn't get up i wouldn't wash i wouldn't i'd sleep in loads i if i'm coaching i work in the evenings there were times where I wouldn't get out of bed until I had to go to coaching at like yeah. four o'clock. Yeah. And it's like, there's no freedom in that because I, I haven't yeah. got the discipline to get up and be like, right, I'm taking care of myself. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this workout. And through doing that workout, having that discipline, having this functioning body, I could then be like, oh, I want to go rock climbing. Yeah, I want to yeah, go do parkour. Yeah. And I start doing all these other it's things. Like, that is it's like discipline is like opened up like, the door of your own freedom in it like because you would never have got there if you didn't have that kind of that if you didn't go through that patch and realize that discipline is important where would you have been yeah and i think i see it a lot in people's lives like especially people that aren't happy with their lives Mm -hmm. is they don't have the discipline to be like they might be overweight for example they might not have the discipline to um sort of restrict their caloric intake and everything and yeah, exercise yeah. and stuff and they get their body in this really bad shape 
and then they don't have the freedom to eat the nice stuff because they haven't gone through that diet and looked at what can I do to look after myself yeah. and it puts them in this dark place. And then I see it in training as well. You've probably seen it. a lot of adults that come in because you do your adult classes. Mm -hmm. Adults that come in that have never done sport probably really struggle with free running because they don't know how to move. They don't know what yeah. strengths they've got. Yeah. But then if you've got an adult that's been doing sports and had a gym routine and stuff, they probably pick it up quicker. They pick it, yeah, yeah, because they know a little bit more about their body. You know, what they and then they would enjoy it more, wouldn't yeah. they? Cause I it's because they put themselves in that discipline of... Yeah, they've had yeah. that discipline of this is how you look yeah. after yourself. Mm -hmm. Now I can have fun with this thing I've built. Yeah, like, yeah, I've yeah. got this body, it's shaped yeah. how I want it, functions yeah. how I want it. Yeah. Now I can like go and play and stuff. Mm -hmm. Once you get untrained adults yeah. probably come in and yeah. overweight and yeah. they struggle, they're like, oh, I can't do this, it's too hard. <laughs> and I'm then they give up then. Yeah. Like, it reminds me a lot of um, <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Have you seen it before? Uh, oh, yeah. It's I a think pyramid, so, yeah. man. It yeah, stands yeah. at the bottom and it's basic survival needs. And yeah. then it goes into um, it's more social needs and relationships, yeah. work security needs. So, first, there's like food, shelter, water, and probably factor things like you know, clean oxygen, yeah. sunlight. Or, Tried to stop you there. All of that. I'm busted. Oh, so, yeah, <laughs> Talk about needs. That. I need to go to the toilet. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's all right. Pause it. Pause it. Re edit that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. And we're back. <laughs> so, sorry about that. That reminds me kind of of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. So at the bottom you've got those bases of I'm looking at the wall like a graph. <laughs> yeah. That's a triangle. Where at the bottom you have the sort of the food, shelter, survival, the uh, basic uh, survival needs, the moving up to security needs, and then moving up to more sort of social needs like uh, relationships, friendships, romantic, and then up to the top then of the pyramid we get self fulfillment. So that's the kind of pursuit of your own kind of like practices, yeah. your kind of self um, creative practices, you know, that what we could call like self actualization the step. Yeah. And that speaks to what we just what we just said about how having that discipline in place kind of fulfills those basic things of like when you haven't even kind of like get up to have a shower or brush your teeth because your discipline's like out of whack entirely. Like whatever, whatever's going on to take that discipline away from you, whether you're suffering your mental health or something's going on in life that it stops you from fulfilling those basic needs to actually yeah. further up the pyramid. Yeah. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Like, because people get, like yourself, you feel like you're in that rut. Um, and then you f the feeling that you have is that you just want to do nothing because that will make you feel better, uh, you know, but the antidote of it is that you have to do something. And then the more you do, the better you feel. And then you start climbing that ladder, yeah. which, you know, you're on about, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it just takes steps, steps, doesn't it? But you've got to be kind of like honest with yourself, have a real, you know, look, like look at yourself from all angles and what you're, what you're doing, what you're up to. And then, make a hum like a humble step you know you're not going to compare yourself to someone else and be like oh they're so disciplined i think you're just going to be that disciplined you know, tomorrow on day one. Do you know i mean I want yeah to do that. you're in a pattern like you, you you've been moving in this pattern for a, a long time and now you've got to try and break this spiral and spiral it the other way before it can turn the other way it needs to slow down for you then to kind of get out of the pattern that you've got in now you're in a new pattern and once you're in that pattern that's it then there's no more effort it's just becoming freedom, like you're saying. Yeah. So those baby steps. Yeah, so like step by step, making a change, um, reducing the things that are not really supporting you or getting the best from you little by little until they're weaned out and then start in placing other practices that fill those, those voids, I guess. Yeah. Mm. That's the way I would see it, but you know. I'm not always like I'm not a super disciplined person. Like I have to be because I got kids and like I got to get up, get them to school. I don't always feel like doing it, but I think that helps. Like a fam, having a family helps me with my my discipline, my routines. Um, to last kind of come back to they were talking about spirituality, mm -hmm. um, but bring into a more tangible sense. Having something that's bigger than you, your family, kind of gives you that. Um, intrinsic motivation to be better yeah big time because you've got a need other than yourself to get somewhere so you know look look at those examples there you know there's a kid stuck under a car and a granny comes up and picks it up it's like yeah 
it's more than themselves, so they get something from somewhere that yeah. pushes them through. Um, you know, on some of your adventure stuff, you've probably got to a point where you feel like giving up, but then you get this like second wind, which is stronger than what you've been running off. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? it's it's crazy. Um, With me, I find <laughs> some of this well actually went up to is a fifty miler is. Uh, when people have asked me, like, oh, when you're on the day and you're doing it, like, what keeps you going? And I think that the whole time you're bearing in mind this, like, massive um, kind of intrinsic motivation of, you know, I'm doing it for this, I'm doing it for this reason, I'm doing it for that. When it actually boils down to it on the day and you're, like, 10 hours in <laughs> and you're just baked in sweat and you've been, been fueling and like, ramming food down, yeah. so it's just kind of a fun, like, eat this, boy, when you're like, oh, I'm not eating more. <laughs> You get to this point where you're no longer focusing on the the top of the part, the heart, the um, pyramid. You're almost living at the bottom. Where yeah. You're just focusing on like moment to moment survival, and it becomes this in itself like a flowy state that you're not thinking about all the reasons why you're doing it. You're just focusing on exactly what you're doing in each moment. Yeah. Example I could use for that is that I'm not into those kind of long endurance things at the minute, but you know. I'd love to get more involved with you guys. I can do some extra stuff like that. But um, I'm not sure if you've seen a documentary on Netflix, 14 Peaks. I haven't yeah. seen it yet, no. Nims guy. I can't believe I've seen it. Every, that, everyone talks about it. That guy, I seen man. That. Nims. Nims blah, blah, blah. That guy. Just pure faith and belief in himself. Like, everyone is, like, even them, them, his team are, like, experts. And they're, like, at the point of giving up. That's, like, next level. And he's, like, he's powerful enough in his mindset to like raise them up and believe in themselves as well like that is just nuts like but he has like a more of a spiritual kind of belief and he believes in something that has given him this power so be it that it really is or psychological it's still working well, it's, it's the same with Goggins <laughs> isn't it he always says a lot of the reasons why he's so disciplined and does what he does is because he doesn't want to get to to God's door and be like God turn around and be like, oh, this is a list you could have like this is what you done this like. thing, <laughs> this this this, and he yeah. looks at it and be like, oh, that's not me. I'm like this overweight guy that kills cockroaches, <laughs> and then God's like, no, that's what you could have been, and that's that's what his motivation, that's his his thing. He's like, I don't want to get there and be like disappointed in God. I want to go there and God be like, wow, you did like all these extra things I didn't expect of you. Yeah. That's, that's his thing, it's just that, that like, external For Goggins, belief. it's like, it seems to really come from his self, doesn't it, as well? Like, you know, it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure if he's got any external kind of drives, like he's doing it for other reasons, but he just wanted to push himself to see where he could he could get to. So pe people do it do do it for themselves, but I think if you attach an extra reason underlying it, I would say not on top of it, underlying it, which literally keeps pushing you forward when you feel like you're about to slow down it's that kind of uh, remember what you're doing it for sort of thing yeah um do you think um because this is one mean real uh, will relate to in terms of goggins is that going to that place of like extreme pain before you turn around to look at u-turn and start going up yeah and i my only experience from that is just health issues like having the blood clot and like having like extreme pain in my leg from like an illness not from pushing myself you know in a in a physical activity but i still went through that and i still had to keep moving forward and if i didn't it would have kept me where, where i was yeah you know? i mean like with goggins he, yeah like, he had a horrible childhood like his dad mm. used to like beat the shit out of his mum yeah. and you know he did, grew, he became a widow beast. He had this job he used to hate. He like couldn't even run around the block. And then from that, he took a U turn and became an entirely different person. Um, yeah. Will's been there with, um, you know, your own mental health struggles. I've been there with like obesity, where you just take this point that destroys you and you just totally turn your life around from yeah. it. Yeah. It's like once you've hit that rock bottom, you can only go up. Yeah. You're a bouncy ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just coming up, coming back up, you know, you, you got to, otherwise, where are you going to go? Like, but do, you, do you think pain could be a good motivator for some people? Not that it should be, but do you think it can? If, if it is, people get to a point where they're in pain and that pain turns into a source of motivation once the perspective mm. shifts. Yeah, I could see like people using pain as fuel for their motivation, 
you know, they can throw that in the furnace to keep them kind of motivated towards yeah. it. And at least then they're not going to so hold back on their problems that they're using those past problems as a lesson or a gem of wisdom to fuel their motivation to move forward. Like, yeah, sort of I thing. think fuel yeah. is a good word for it. Yeah. Not necessarily the source of the motivation, no. but the fuel for growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Because it's like, that's that shit in the background. But now... I've, I'm more than that now because I'm using that for this and it's like more compelling where you're going is bigger than where you've come from sort of thing like you know yeah. do you think it's kind of like with um, getting people to succeed in you know as a coach when you coach them uh, we, we often know that uh, encouragement is a better model for getting people yeah. to develop than to you know like, oh you're doing this wrong and criticize yeah, yeah. the dogs we know it but yeah. do you think that having a look at that past pain and seeing how far you've come, like, you know what, I've done that. It's actually a better motivator than that self-criticizing narrative. Big time. If you can flip a positive onto any of that stuff, I, I'm i sure it's, it's better than just, you know, piling on all the negatives and making you feel like you're know, worthless or unable to do it. At least, like, throwing on a positive, you know, you haven't quite done it, but this was good about that and... You're like, ah, you feel better about yourself. You feel like you've achieved, feel like you're progressing. Um, yeah, and praise raises people, you know, like, you know, criticism. Not many people can deal with that quite well. Yeah. Only s- certain people can use that as fuel as well. So that's a better you know? kind of like more self loving practice as well for motivation versus that. Uh, say on the majority, like I've seen like the majority, or... yeah, majority of people I've coached is so I've seen like better results in giving them positive feedback rather yeah. than like, negative it's only it's only sometimes when you want to like snap people out of their like way of looking at things that you know maybe a, ne- a little negative would you know do yeah. well in that situation I so you can go hold on and like reassess i mean in terms of like per- like how you personally treat yourself so like internal narrative do you think that having that positive coach to yourself when you're talking to yourself in your head is better versus being um kind of constantly berating yourself to be better Kind of almost like that um, sense of like self love and acceptance and kind of pushing yourself and lifting yourself up into what you could be versus kind of berating yourself for not being what you want to be. Yeah, um, like everyone's got that self critic, haven't they? Like, yeah. That you know, criticizing voice in their head, like now and again, especially if people are ambitious and if they're over ambitious, it's even louder. Do you mean? So Tell me like, about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, how do you, you know, if you can't quiet it down, yeah. how can you take the trigger off? And, like, maybe you've got to develop another voice that kind of chills that one down a little bit. You know? voice is going well, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> I, I think it's different for different people. Yeah. Like, I know I definitely benefit a lot from the, the critic in me. That is a lot of motivation for me, is, is the critic. I don't think... If I had a more self-loving voice, I would push myself as hard. In fact, I know I wouldn't because I've been in that place where I've been more accepting of everything and more self-loving that I struggle then achieving the things I need. Because in my head, the things I need to achieve are more important than how I feel. So I think it's very Mm. different for everyone and what they're being through, especially when I was a firefighter. Being the best firefighter I could was way more important than how I felt. There was like nothing more important than being able to turn up to a job and know that I could save a life if I had to, mm. rather than being like, oh, I don't really feel like doing this today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go easy on myself. I'm gonna have some snacks. I'm gonna sit down. But I don't have yeah. self love anymore. That's yeah. uh, that's become the masquerade of self love. Was when it first appeared in when it self love very much. I think the idea came from that Eastern culture, mm. Eastern philosophies, and then when it started to kind of get popular in the West. We got this kind of, oh, well, self love is I'm going to go buy myself a 500 pound Gucci bag because yeah, I want it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, that's not actually self love yeah. because if you came to me as my friend and was like, ah, would you think I need to actually love myself and look after myself? I'm not going to say 500 quid yeah, back. Yeah. But my point was like, you're saying like what I was saying wasn't self love. But if I'd asked anyone at that period of my time, if like, oh, what should I do to look after myself? They'd have been like, you need to slow down and like take a couple of rest days, mate. That's what you need to do. Like you need to let your body relax. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Everyone gives bad advice though these days. With like, yeah. especially when it comes to when you're pushing yourself. 
a lot of people I find, especially in my experience, when I've done any sort of challenge or even just training, I'm constantly getting told you need to slow down, you need to stop pushing yourself by everyone around me. And mm -hmm. even, I might have just finished a week of pure rest, like no strength training, and it's day one back on those, and they oh, you need to stop, you need to slow down. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you are a person that's pushing yourself a lot, then you got to find time to do a little bit of the opposite yeah. and do some practices which chill you out. Because the thing is, like, people are so, some people are, are so push themselves, but then, you know, when they're outside of the thing they're pushing themselves towards, even in other parts of their life, they're not getting rest. Yeah. So then they're, they're properly burning the candle from both ends. Do you know what I mean? Rather than be like, right, I've pushed myself in this activity. Now I know I need to like look after myself to benefit pushing myself again. Yeah. Like, and that's a bit more like self-love, not like kind of letting yourself off the hook, but just being that kind of like that care inside of you that like, yeah, you're pushing yourself, but you're not going to kind of like, you know, put loads of weight on yourself. You're going to feel out. Yeah. Yeah. You, you kind of when you realize a little bit of your limits and you're pushing them a little bit to be, have that bit of compassion with yourself. More like doing what's best If, if you, you feel like you're failing and then you're feeling like a negative, like kind of feeling from that, you know? I suppose what I'm getting at is choosing to do more what's best for you versus doing what you always want. Because I find yeah, yeah. with the training for the challenges I do sometimes, what I want in terms of how I'm training is not necessarily what's best for me. No. Like I'll be pushing myself to complete failure every single session. And by the end of the week, it's like I'm bedridden for like a couple of hours longer. Like I sat a morning or something. I was training for the yoke. Mm -hmm. but actually, normally it's Sunday morning because Saturday was normally the hardest day of the week. And then what I actually needed then was to take that pressure off. Yeah. But I chose not to. And that actually wasn't the best thing at times because it did mean crashing. I just think it's different for different people. Everyone's got their own different approach. Everyone responds to things differently. I know I respond quite well to listening to that inner critic and having that that massive pressure on myself. Um, whereas other people, it's like a driving force for you. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it is just very different for different people and what their mentality is like. Anyway, um, for you, I can imagine it's more self loving because you're more laid back. You've got like your family. You've got all these other things for you. Whereas for me, it's like. I've got quite this dark stuff going on anyway, so I need that critic to push me. And if I was more accepting of things and everything, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have got to where I am now, to be honest. I think I can relate to that um, in terms of going over obesity. I found that overcoming that was a very dark internal process. It wasn't um, a nice voice going on a lot of the time. That kind of the hours I used to spend training and just staring at the same bricks on the wall while I was on a cross train for three hours like every single day and your head space was a very dark space during that time like, mm -hmm. I can relate to that that critic is sometimes the best weapon you have when you're in that zone yeah that helps you survive um is that voice like calm down now for me it's totally flipped now so yeah. I, I can get where you come from with that well but I feel like today where I am in terms of my training lifestyle it's almost like I felt like I've done a lot of work um, after, I, I don't say that the first challenge I did took me for that process mm. and I went from when I trained, I used to overtrain constantly because of it. And then I went from that process of kind of doing a lot of inner work, a lot more kind of like meditation, journaling, yeah. and had my first proper massive like fatigue, uh, crash as well. Um, it was halfway through training actually for the push the track type pen of van and I did a 50% push uh, training and after that I had to stop training for a month and I was like really badly fatigued, I had a lot of injuries and my headspace was the darkest place I'd ever been for them. I started getting a lot of like, anxiety out of nowhere. I had my first panic attack and never had one before and um, thankfully I've never any more since. <laughs> I could just one nip it in the bed hopefully. But uh, after that it, everything changed. I started yeah. to come to that more kind of like self-loving practice with things. And since then, it's like that critic is still very much there and it speaks very loud. But now it's also got another kind of like opposing voice that kind of balances it out. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm probably a little bit different to both of you, but like 
listening to that, like, and you're both using the word dark, that's a, that's a metaphor, you know, that's a metaphor for how you're feeling. It's like dark, you know, but maybe when you only realize the dark, that then you can discover that there is light. Yeah. And that, like, you know, glimpse in there, it's not always a bad negative thing, that there is, like, use for it to be, like, even more kind of where you need to go. Have you ever heard of um, shadow work? Yeah, I have, yeah. But, um, Jungian psychology. Yeah, I've heard a little bit. It freaks me out, though. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of going into the past a bit and confronting those um, more uh, shadowy parts yourself Yeah, and kind of having a conversation with them and going for those experiences that yeah. you didn't necessarily deal with in the best way. Yeah, I, I, I know time. nothing about it, but what, all I've heard is that like parts of the shadow, of your shadow, is like it's actually quite helpful. Yeah. But like different ways that you may become over ambitious or like you're suppressing something that yeah. is kind of then manifested in like bad behaviors or like negative things that you're doing. It was when you um, said about dipping back into that darker side being useful made me think of it. Yeah. Once you realize the crap that you're kind of capable of. Yeah. <laughs> makes you realize shit, I need to be over there instead of like, you know, because as I spent a bit of time diving into it, it was part of it was going back and looking at things in your life that were traumatic. And yeah. I've I've got um, a client who actually um, is honestly she's a occupational therapist, mm -hmm. and she deals with a lot of people with trauma. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple of conversations with her about um, in terms of helping people and my interest in psychology. And what I gauge is that no matter what trauma you've been through it's almost like you know like we got like power to weight ratio in sports science in terms of you know how yeah. say how much can you bench compared to how much you weigh yeah. that everyone's trauma no matter if it was something that didn't seem too significant to you to one person versus what happened in someone else's life is it kind of scales in a similar way so say um say someone's trauma is that their dad left them when they were really young Whereas someone else's trauma was that they watched the dad get run over by a car in front of them and get smeared like a felt tip marker. And it was like really graphic. Visual. Like really, <laughs> exactly, like really messed up. But the other ones that the dad left when they were young. Hmm. And yeah, they're both bad. One is clearly a lot more traumatic than the other. Or, well, one we may think is more traumatic than the other. But for someone else, that level of trauma that one caused or maybe it's that they got left for a few hours by the dad when they were really young mm -hmm. and it caused this level of like some sort of deep root of trauma that, and stuff and yeah that. that influences them for years and they never confront that and it yeah. shows up in kind of um unbeknownst behaviors to them later in life yeah. and they so don't actually know like a lot of it is not them. actually who you are then isn't it yeah like who you truly are is where who you want to be yeah really that's who you probably truly are but then these things that have happened from the past and that like have just created this shadow of you know you're not operated in the way that you need to, need to it's kind of like quite a healing practice because it's yeah. going back and confronting things with new yeah. perspective but some people dialogue with them. some people don't like doing that it's, no, they it's, don't. it's scary isn't it because it's, it's like that was it is very yeah. much therapy you're, you're looking at things that you don't want to kind of keep seeing and stuff yeah um i've done an nlp course like um an nlp coach and there's a practice on there called timeline therapy, which helps people kind of release emotions off the past without actually stepping in visually and seeing any of that stuff that they saw. Yeah. So you're still dealing with those past traumas and releasing all that because there's some level of you can't reach your potential somewhere unless you've dealt with some of those things and put it to rest. Yeah. Like put them in a box and put it to the side and just keep walking on that path because you, they're never going to disappear, but like, you know, you're going to be able to like put it in a box that the lid can open whenever and you can check and, you know, see how it is, but it, it's there and then you can carry on with your, with your life sort of thing. A good analogy um, I heard for it before was imagine you've got a air balloon you just keep pumping the gas on it and you can only go so fast, but you still haven't cut the sandbags loose. And if you were to literally just cut the sandbags loose, the tiniest bit of gas, you'd be so <laughs> boy and you would shoot up anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So bringing that light feeling in it. Yeah, yeah. lighter. Because, mm. yeah, you're not bound by it. Where's the past? Do you know what I mean? Like, where is it? Yeah. It's, like, it's actually gone. Like, it's just now a memory. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's shit like that. It is interesting. But it's like, 
yeah, you got you can't you got to stop looking that way, or that way, a little bit that way, <laughs> like future whatever, but more just realize what's ah, that's a cool room. Like, <laughs> Bring back a bit into, more into the that. more physical sense. Then we talked yeah. about breathwork earlier because I I use breathwork every day. I know for some like for me, it's more now like a meditative practice and uh, practice and the source of um trying to keep my immune system quite boosted as well for training to keep mm-hmm. me training at a high level, but. When I first started doing it, it had that more wow factor to it, like you were getting the highest off of that. But when I've seen some people practice it, I know that like trauma and like the past can be stored in the body in a more physical sense. And you'll see things like people actually having like spasms or even having um they'll almost having like muscular fits when they're performing breath work from the release of that trauma. Wow. It's crazy. Isn't it? So like a lot of your emotions are embedded in like your body, basically. Yeah. That's why movement is so important. Movement is medicine. Yeah, movement is medicine. And it's expressive yeah. as well. And then, yeah, when you keep, like, you know, if your mind's drifting, you know, in, in sort of more of the shadowy memories and stuff like that, at least, like, movement is something that keeps you so present that just keeping that movement practice, eventually, you're just going to be out of that. That's going to become your world, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So... Yeah, that stuff won't bother you anymore. You know, that's the way I would kind of see it. I'm no expert in in that field, but yeah, it is scary to look at. I, I can see why people don't want to go there. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's one of the scariest fair pay boys. <laughs> yeah, all right. I think that's a, a good place to sum it all up. Good. Um, thanks for coming, Craig. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me, me buddy. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you so much. Nice um, one. Yeah, all the best, you guys. Like guys got good characters like and it's it's a really good idea yeah. so yeah it's, it's be interesting to see where you are and, you. Okay. and it's great that you're, you're the first first podcast guest yeah so hopefully it doesn't uh, <laughs> yeah hopefully it doesn't you know gives you a good <laughs> a good like um yeah nice one for yeah. sure so <laughs> as per usual guys um podcasts are coming out every other week um gonna keep recording and we've got quite a, a backlog at the moment um got the youtube videos coming out yeah um, by the time this comes the out um our youtube video doing our testing will already be out that's quite a fun one to film so i can imagine it's quite fun <laughs> i still feel it now um and yeah taylor what's your usual bit oh all right so <laughs> well before we get our usual bit guys if you want to follow Craig, where's the best place to go? Where do you go if you want to see what you get up to? I'm not on social media that much, to be honest. I'm just kind of like, just, yeah, just oh, an ordinary yeah, person. Like... But like, I've got an Instagram page. You're a real human, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I have been Instagram? thinking of like, you know, starting like a, a YouTube and stuff like that. But yeah, like at the minute, I'm only on Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a place people could go? Is that like a work Instagram where I'm parkour? No, that's or... just my own personal Instagram. Um, or you can find me in Fluidity Free Run Academy. So, um, so it's like yeah. the time. Not crazy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So guys then, obviously podcast, if you listen to this, you're on Spotify, so you know about us. So or YouTube, because now we've got the cameras working. Yeah, indeed. Podcast, YouTube. YouTube too. If you don't know already and you want to listen in the car or something, then Spotify. Uh go follow us on social media on all of our normal regular channels, which is Facebook and Instagram, which is gonna be at the Adventure Athletes. You can also find a link tree there where you can find access to our free training program, which at the moment is Average to Athlete 1.0, which is a sort of start uh, training program for those of you that want to get into very more adventure athlete style of training, but don't necessarily have the um, the knowledge, uh, not so much knowledge, but you're, you're more, you're in the world of sports and fitness and you're kind of enjoying the gym, but you want to upgrade at that next level where you're going to train more athletically and diversely and get introduced to new movements and ways of training that you can actually fit realistically into a week around life as well. So that program's out for you for free now. So you can go download that Viber link tree. And then that's it. Yeah, these mm-hmm. call outs are meant to be like short, short trailer. <laughs> that's what editing is for. I'm not going to edit the podcast. You didn't do that. <laughs> Great <Go> pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So thanks, everyone, um, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, and remember, who adventures lives. I've already stopped recording me. <laughs>